Welcome to the Resilient Recruiter Podcast. I'm your host, Mark Whitby, and today we're joined by Christina Stroud. Christina is the founder and CEO of Group 928. She's a seasoned human resources professional with over 30 years of experience specializing in startups, acquisitions, and exits in private equity environments. After a successful career in HR, Christina took the entrepreneurial leap, founding her executive search firm three years ago in South Carolina. That was September 2020. In just three short years, the company has grown by 400% from 125,000 in her first year to over 500,000 in 2023. This showcases Christina's ability to build client base from scratch, design and implement sales and marketing strategies while continuing to exceed her client's expectations. Christina's been a client of ours for just over 18 months, and she's been so successful at implementing our strategies that we've made her a mentor within our community of recruitment business owners. Christina is also a, a podcast host, and her show is called Manufacturing 365. Christina, welcome. Thank you so much for being here. Oh, thank you, Mark. I really appreciate you uh, asking me to be a guest. I'm so glad that we're finally doing this. Uh, I've wanted to get you on the show for a while, so uh, so I'm excited that we're that we're making it happen. No, I was going to say I I appreciate you working around my schedule over the last couple weeks. Uh, and working with the time zone difference, too, that always adds a, a little extra challenge. Totally. So, Christina, could you tell me more about your transition from an H- as an HR professional to a successful recruiting firm owner? Absolutely. So I was in HR for more than 30 years, uh, all with manufacturing companies, um, had different manufacturing plants across the country, was traveling a lot. Uh, my last role, I was traveling three weeks out of uh, every four and decided that that was probably a bit much for me. So I wanted to uh, find a different career, but still using the skill set that I had honed over the years. And there was an outside recruiter that was my partner for many, many years. And I really liked the company. I liked him. I trusted him. And so uh, we went to lunch and I asked if he had any suggestions for my next step in my career. And he said, well, you need to come work for me. You've done everything but be the actual recruiter. And so that's what I did and uh, worked for him for a year and a half or so, two years, Uh, learned how to be a recruiter on the other side of the table. And then uh, on a crazy whim, decided it was time to open my own shop. And uh, it was a hard transition. It was scary. It was um, something I never, ever dreamed that I would do. Uh, but now I'm super glad I did. I'm thankful that I learned a lot uh, working for him. And I feel like I'm still in the HR community, honestly. I, I, I miss being part of some of the other parts of HR, but it's, it's great to work with HR folks all day. Fantastic. So how did your background in HR contribute to your success with your recruiting firm? Well, I think the 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 years of experience that I had laid a really nice foundation. So when I'm working with clients, I have worked in their shoes. I know what it's like to work with good recruiters and with recruiters who definitely need improvement. So I knew the things that I wanted to bring into my business. <laughs> um, I also knew what they're going through. So recruiting is is probably part of what they're responsible for, and they have a lot of other things on their plate, and I understood that. So it's very easy for me to know when to communicate, how much to communicate, what's important to them and what's not. Um, and so it just really made uh, an easy transition for the client side. For my candidates, um, I think is actually a a really nice benefit because I know what they're looking for. I've been through job searches myself in the manufacturing industry, uh, so I know what what to share with them, what the hot buttons are going to be for them. Um, And so it just is really nice when I'm representing a client and the candidate can figure out exactly like I'm part of their team. You know, I'm representing them. I've been there and it makes sense. That makes total sense, Christina. I know that you've said that HR is your native language, and there's things that you're able to do and value you're able to bring to your relationships that many other recruiters are not able to. Could you elaborate a little on the sorts of additional things that your specific background enables you to facilitate for clients? Sure. So 
the clients are, um, I, I don't want to say my first priority, but I, I feel very, very close to them because I understand their world. And so the um, the fact that I call it my native language, that's what I was born into. That was my uh, second job after grad school. Um, I learned the ins and outs of HR, uh, doing it for 30 years for a lot of different companies. And so um, when I'm talking to my clients, I understand and can help guide them when it comes to organizational changes and decisions, what their org charts might want to look like, uh, if they're unsure exactly which role they're looking for, or if they want to combine roles. Um, I understand uh, what their recruiting processes are, and I can suggest ways to make it more efficient or improve it or tell them that they're doing great and I wouldn't change anything at all. So it works really, really well when I can ask questions and guide through more in a business partner or consultative way than being a recruiter who has not lived in that world and, and may not understand it from the inside um, out. Um, the other thing is I can ask very thought-provoking questions, really something that they may not have spent time sitting down and really thinking through because they have so many roles open that they're trying to fill. Um, and so I can really ask the tough questions and make them in a one-hour conversation uh, sure that what they want to ask and what they're looking for in a candidate is exactly um, what they need. And since I spend most of my time in the private equity world, I worked for three different private equity companies. And it's not like any other type of industry. Uh, I have found either people really like it or they really don't. I personally loved it. Um, and so when I'm working with a private equity client, it's super easy for me to ask questions that shows them I understand private equity and I also know what it takes to be a candidate that can work for that company and succeed. Uh, and do really well because when I'm screening them and assessing them, uh, it all it all makes sense to me, and I can picture them in that role. Fantastic! All right, I love it. So take me back to September 2020. You've taken that entrepreneurial leap and decided that you're going to start Group 928. What was that first year like? <laughs> it was hard. <laughs> I I. You know, that first year, it, it was really hard for me emotionally. Um, I had never stepped away from a regular paycheck. Uh, and so to go into owning my own business, um, not having a steady income or a check that gets direct deposited every other Friday was very nerve wracking for me. Um, and uh, it hurt my ego a little bit when I went two months without getting uh, a paycheck. But then once I really got my company started, uh, I was glad that I did and it made sense. But that transition uh, is very hard for a lot of people. And it definitely was uh, in my case. Um, it was also hard because I had never done any type of sales or marketing or bringing in new clients. The company that I worked for before as a recruiter gave us the clients. The owner would do all the business development and then pass a client to us. So realizing that I had to figure out how to reach out to clients, how to build those relationships, um, find the right clients for me and one where I knew I could really help them in a, in a timely manner um, was very daunting for me. And it took a while to really get comfortable with that sales and marketing. Uh, but that, that first year of having to build your own business um, and your book of business uh, was was very frustrating at times for sure. Um, but you know, through it all, I kept pushing myself and pushing myself and thinking, if other people can do it, I can do it. I know how to run a business. I've reported to CEOs uh, for a very long time. Uh, I know all the different functions in a business, so it was just a matter of pulling all that together. Um, but yeah, that first year was was rough, um, and I probably would not want to do it again. Thank you so much for sharing honestly about, you know, going through that really challenging first year. I loved the statement that you made, which is that if other people can do this, then I can do it too. That's a really empowering belief system to adopt is that, you know, you're a capable person and if it's possible for someone else, then you can figure out how to do it too. So 
when did um when did things sort of start clicking into place where you hit your stride and you felt like, hey, I'm actually good at this? It it took about um I would say probably eight or nine months where I really started feeling comfortable in my own skin. So I was very fortunate that my uh, previous company allowed me to bring two of my clients that I had build a, been building relationships with um, with me. And those two clients came with me. We continued to work together that first year. I'm very, very thankful um, that that happened. And it helped me try out different processes, try out different um, questionnaires I was using, different recruiting methods, um, interviewing skills. And they knew I was uh, starting on my own and forging my own path, and they were very patient with me. Um, and so that, that was definitely a big help. Um, and then once I had a few placements under my belt with those two, then I started hearing back from new clients that I had been reaching out to and I started realizing, hey, all of my work is starting to pay off. And once you have a little bit of confidence, then I think you perform even better, right? You're, you're performing from a place um, of uh, instead of chaos and worry, um, you're, you're performing from a place of confidence and happiness and you realize you are helping other people and it just continues to grow from there. Love it. It's the virtue cycle of success, right? You're getting some results that boost your confidence, which means that you take even more quantity and quality of action, and that gives you even better results. And now you're really on a on a roll. Um, so can you talk a little bit about accelerate the about that virtuous cycle? So like because you increase my four hundred percent in just three years is phenomenal. A lot of people get to, once they get to kind of low six figures, then they kind of plateau there, but you've just continuously progressed and, and improved as you go along. What were some of the critical success factors? There were a few things for me, I think that were um, sort of the spark that continued uh, to push me and to push the company. Um, one is I really had to learn to get out of my comfort zone. Uh, the things that I had been doing as a mm. recruiter on the other side of the table when I was working for companies um, didn't necessarily 100% apply to running my own search firm. So I had to dig deep. Um, I had to take every little thing that needed to be done as a challenge. Um, I did all the work myself. I was, um, you know, doing sourcing and interviewing and all the emails and communication. And uh, that taught me a lot of new skills and things that I had to try and push myself to do that uh, I hadn't done in a, in a very, very long time. So that part was great. Um, the other things that happened was I learned how to do a lot of sales and marketing through automation. Um, I never thought I would do that. Those people who know me know that I have a technology dark cloud that follows me. It is a struggle wherever I go for whatever reason. And so to think that I was going to be using this as one of my main tools to try and find clients and at least start that initial relationship was uh, very daunting. Now I enjoy it because I found ways to make it work for me. Um, but that, that automation seemed to me to be very impersonal, but it's not, you can make it very, very personable. And then, um, in my case, that's really what started the company to grow, uh, was to do things that were from my voice and to the people I wanted to work with. Um, and the clients responded to it for sure. And that's really how I've been able to grow the business, uh, over the last few years. Amazing. So <clears throat> Let's break those two things down because I think they're both really valuable to explore. The first was challenging yourself and stepping outside your comfort zone. And I understand you have a kind of a history of taking on challenges and being willing to, to get uncomfortable, even stemming back to your days with BMW. Could you share a story or an example of how you, maybe where you developed that ability to really push yourself outside your comfort zone? 
Sure. It's something that happened um, organically for me. I did not realize that I was a risk taker. I didn't realize that I take challenges and, um, you know, I kind of, I treat a challenge or a new task like a sport. Like I want to beat um, or win that competition to develop that skill. Um, but it, it sort of developed when I was at BMW. I was at their first manufacturing plant in the U.S. It's actually still their only plant uh, here in South Carolina. And I got there shortly after they opened and they did not have all the functions they needed within HR. They didn't have processes. There were definitely no systems. Um, and my vice president uh, started me in recruiting. I did that for two years. We built up the function. And then she said, okay, now I want you to go to pay and benefits. And there was one person doing that for a several thousand do- a thousand person company. So we improved that and put a lot of processes in place. And then I went to a different function. So I went to, to six different functions and she, she ended up nicknaming me the fixer because I was going in and taking what they had and improving it and making it better and stronger. And there were a lot of mistakes made, at, you know, as well. But again, it goes back to that sports um, background. And, you know, if, if we messed up something, we'd turn around to punt again, right? It wasn't anything that couldn't be fixed. And so over time, I realized, well, you can try things, you can take risks, calculated risks for sure. Um, and as long as you're pushing yourself and trying new things, then that's how your company is going to continue to get better. And so without me um, consciously thinking about it, that's sort of who I became. And I've carried that through for all the jobs I've had into recruiting is let's try things. Let's take them head on. Let's push ourselves and see what happens. And if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. Then we go and try something again. And that's that's definitely now I realize something that has carried through my whole life. I love that uh, mindset, definitely, of being willing to try new things. And then if it doesn't work, you try something else. And if that doesn't work, you try something else. Or you figure out how to improve it. And I like that nickname, The Fixer. That uh, <laughs> Knowing you, that, that seems like a great, uh, a great fit. So wasn't there a crossroads in your career, though, when you were <clears throat> with BMW, where you stepped into a role as head of in- international HR, and then that took you, that really challenged you yet again to, um, you know, to be exposed to different environments. Yes. Um, I'm glad you asked about that. You've definitely done your homework. So I, um, within, <laughs> within the BMW HR, there were about six, six or different, seven different functions. One of the functions was called International HR, and it was responsible mostly for the inpatriates and the expatriates going between Germany, South Africa, Mexico, and other countries um, with our plant in South Carolina. So you were responsible for getting everybody back and forth and assimilated into the new culture and so forth. Um, And the other part of the responsibility was working with Germany, which is where our headquarters are, of course, and working on new policies and how to implement them group-wide, company-wide, and make sure that it made sense for the U.S. laws and and back and forth. So the person responsible for that in South Carolina had always been German. They were always a high-potential person in Germany that they needed to sort of check their resume, get that little checkbox that says that they've been international. So they would come to South Carolina, work for two years in that role, and then go back. And then they'd get another person, and they'd stay two years and go back. So I had done a lot of the functions within HR, but not that one. And I knew it was time for them to find a new replacement. So I went to my vice president and I said, what would you think about me taking that role? It's something I have never done. I know nothing about it. I'm not qualified, um, but I think it would be exciting and fun. And it would be kind of cool to have an American in that role for at least two years. Let's just see what happens. And uh, she had to fight with the headquarters in Germany just because it was a change to a structure and one of the roles that they used for international development. Uh, But she won and they awarded me the position. And so for two years, 
I was flying to Germany for two weeks and then coming back home for three weeks or sometimes four weeks and then going again for two weeks. And I had to learn all about anything international, inpats, expats, policies, visas, immigration, green cards. Um, I had to work with some difficult relationships um, when Germany wanted to roll out policies uh, or benefits group wide, but we weren't allowed to do those types of things in the U.S. or it didn't make sense for our plants because we had a different culture. So um, learning to um, build those relationships, but have uh, also some disagreements along the way with somebody from a different culture was new for me. Um, and so I really, when I look back, that was actually one of my most favorite jobs ever because I knew nothing. But when I left a few years later, I felt like I had made a difference. Uh, I had built a lot of relationships and still to this day have friends in Germany uh, that work for the company. And it just really uh, opened my eyes and realized I can do anything I want to as long as you put in the time and the work and the research. Um, you you can do it. There, there's no reason why somebody can't set out and do something completely different. That's awesome, Christina. By the way, the reason I'm delving into this is because I know and hopefully a lot of our listeners understand that mindset is such a huge factor in your success, right? In anybody's success. And so I'm I'm I I'm really curious about that, understanding what makes people tick, what their psychology is and how they approach things. And we've found that the people who are the most successful in our program are the people who are willing to try new things, who are, you know, willing to get outside their comfort zone. And so it's really interesting to me where where this all stems from and how it's um how you have displayed that in other roles. Because didn't you also then leave your very um safe and lucrative job and join a startup in the electric vehicle space? I did. So one thing about BMW uh, in South Carolina is it's the largest employer in South Carolina, I believe, except for the health system here. Um, and when I started, there were 500 of us or so. When I left, it was around 10,000 people. So that's how large it had grown. Wow. People did not leave BMW. <laughs> Um, they paid well. They had amazing benefits. They cared about all of the employees. Um, I mean, it, it just is a terrific company. I highly recommend it to, to everybody locally here that wants to move into automotive. But after 15 years, I had done all the roles. I you know, was in a place where it was going to be doing the same type of work. Uh, I had already been through two plant expansions, major hiring. Um, you know, new vehicles launching, and it, it had just been a really exciting time. The only other place that I could have gone within HR would have been applying for the vice president role, but that required you to go to Germany for a few years first. And at the time, I was a single mom with two young kids, and I just didn't think that that was going to work uh, for my family. And so I started looking around and thinking, Okay, I love my company. I adore all the people I work with, but I need to keep challenging myself. And there was an electric vehicle company here uh, in South Carolina that had um, just lost all of its funding. All the investors pulled out. And there's a whole dramatic story behind that that I'll, I'll save you from. Um, but they called me out of the blue and said, hey, um, we have no money. We're trying to get new investors. Uh, there's only five of us left, but we really want to try and make this company work. Would you be interested? And I jumped on the opportunity. And very honestly, I didn't consciously think about what I was leaving. It was more about, okay, I need a new challenge. This sounds like a crazy opportunity. I might regret this, but I know I'm going to have a lot of fun because I'm going to be doing things that I hadn't done in a long time. And so I went. And um, the day of my final interview, I showed up. There was a line of vendors sitting outside wanting uh, their payments. They hadn't been paid in months. Um, and I went inside and accepted the oh, job. My <laughs> and the craziness started. And I was with them for several years. Um, loved it. But again, it was another opportunity, you know, to push myself and try something I had not done. 
Um, and we were very successful. I stayed a few years, left to go do another startup, but they um, continued to grow and uh, eventually went public. So uh, very, very proud of that one. But it was wow. um, it was definitely That's something cool. that you, you know, that you just have to take that chance if you're not going to have that opportunity again. Love it. I'm sure your experience working both in with for a multinational corporation as well as for startups and PE backed companies definitely gives you a depth of experience that you can bring to your recruiting business. So let's let's go back to your recruiting role. And you start you said that one of the keys to your success was embracing technology, embracing automation, even though you say that you're you know, technologically uh, inept, which obviously can't be true because, um, you know, you, you've been, you've been very successful with it. So can you talk to us about the sales and marketing campaigns? And um, you also mentioned that your concern with automation was that it would be in, impersonal, which is the exact opposite of how you wanted to come across. So how did you, um, how did you find a way of uh, marrying the automation technology with the personal touch? So I struggled with that, um, and and I I sort of um, pushed against the idea of automation for a while. I kept thinking this is not what I want to do. We've all sat, we've all had, you know, these emails come through that are so salesy. Or as soon as somebody connects with you, they start selling you their business or their pitch. And it just makes you feel like you don't know the person um, and that you would be working with. And I used to, when I was in HR, I would just delete all those emails and I would not answer the phone if I saw somebody was calling because I didn't know those folks. And I always chose recruiters that I knew and that I had known for a while and that I trusted and I knew I could have a very open relationship with. And so when I went to into my own business, I knew that's what I had to do. And so I started using automation for my specific target companies that I knew I wanted to work with. I had researched them. I had uh, figured out where they were location-wise, what the size of the company was. Um, and I started researching the CEOs and the head of HR and make sure they had the type of um, career and background of people that would be interested in working with recruiters, um, who they had a relationship with. And those are the companies that I decided I really, really wanted to work with. So when I started doing email campaigns, um, I used uh, a couple different tools until I found the one that I like the most. Um, and my communications were very personal. It wasn't, hey, here's what we do. Here's what we can offer you. Here's how I'm going to change your life. It was a lot more of here's what my other clients are seeing. You know, here's, here's what I know about the market. If, if it makes sense for us to have those conversations and see if my tips can help you in the future, that would be great. And people started responding um, because it was more of what I knew about their market, what I knew about their job, um, my background in HR. And so it made them feel, at least the intent was to make them feel that I was a partner to them already. And I wasn't pushing or selling or um, you know, trying to trick them into opening a bunch of emails with clickbait and so forth. It really was, here's some information I know. I hope it helps you. And once I realized that that personal approach worked, then all of my future uh, marketing and uh, campaigns worked the same way. And that's what I've used. I've been able to use that HR background and my market knowledge uh, to provide services. And then when they need something, they will call me because they know that I understand them and it works. And all of that could be done automated. And I had no idea. I didn't realize you could take an extra few minutes and really tailor your campaigns and make them personal. Um, but once I did and it worked, then it made perfect sense to me. I love that. Christina, you're such, this is the reason why we promoted you to be a mentor within our community because um, you're execution of strategies is fantastic. And also you 
take them even further. So, you know, starting with your ideal client avatar, knowing exactly the sort of clients that you wanted to work with. Um, some people call that ICP, ideal client profile. We call it an avatar. And then, you know, building your dream 100 list, which is like your ideal prospect companies the, and you've researched those companies, you know that they potentially could be good. You could be a good partner for them on the talent acquisition side of things. And then following our client acquisition blueprint. And, but again, you know, anybody can follow a, a framework, but you've really thought about this and you've made it your own. You've made it super um, relevant to your target clients, which is, of course, the secret to it being successful is that you need to speak their language to use the right terminology. And as you say, if you come across too salesy or, you know, or it's too generic, then the message isn't going to land. It's just going to get deleted. And you're uh, showcasing your knowledge and showing that you understand their pain points as well as their goals, what they're trying to achieve, what their challenges are, and speak their language in order to um, to get them to want to book a call with you. So I think you've done just a brilliant job. I, I hope you feel proud of what you've accomplished. It's um, it's it's really amazing. What are some of the other sales and marketing um, things that you've done that you feel have contributed to this this picture of you know the the growth trajectory you've been on? So first, let me say um, that, yes, we we realized that the personalization was key uh, for our company and who we wanted it to be, but I don't want to take all the credit for it. So I have worked with uh, your coaching group now for, I don't know, a year and a half, maybe somewhere in that time frame, and I have learned from um the processes and the things that you have taught through the program, um, I've learned from all of the other members of your community. We push each other, we question each other. We, uh, you know, if I try something and it doesn't work, I let other people know and I ask them what did work for them. And so that community has really sparked ideas and suggestions. And, um, and I've learned so much from that group. So I, I feel, yes, I feel very proud of what we've accomplished, but I will say I would never, ever be in this position without joining um, your group, for sure. Um, absolutely part of the foundation of, of who Group 928 is. Um, as far as um, other things that we have done, so um, we, I, I believe, and my my team believes that uh, individual communication with the CEOs or uh, the vice president of operations, whatever function you're recruiting for, is key. And so we end up having a lot of just one-on-one -on -one conversations. We always use um, Zoom or Teams or some type of automated system. So we're you know, you're, you're as close as you can get without traveling across the country to have a cup of coffee. And we interview that person without it making feel like an interview. So we, we get to know that hiring manager just as much as we know all of the candidates that we're going to interview. So it's amazing what a 45 minute conversation with someone can be just by asking about their career and the things that they've done and what's been their greatest achievement, What time, when did they hire somebody and it didn't work out. So the more you ask them and understand them, and it, you can really sort of develop what type of candidate they're looking for. Um, and then when you're recruiting your candidates, you know exactly what type of person or style is going to work well with that hiring manager. Um, and so that type of step before you even do a kickoff call with the client, but really understanding who the hiring manager is, is part of our process that has been very, very successful for us. And I think has really bolstered our marketing campaign because we sell that a lot. And we talk about how we need to get to know um, the hiring manager. Um, we've also done gifts. Um, so we went kind of old school. Remember at Christmas, you used to get lots of plates of cookies and treats and stuff from, uh, from vendors, or at least I know HR folks do. Um, I, I used to have a desk full of boxes of things from folks. 
um, that wanted to work with with our company. Um, so now as a recruiter, I I do that as well, but I don't do it at Christmas time. Um, at Christmas, I'll send them a nice video uh, of me saying Merry Christmas that's personalized to each person with their name and their company. Um, but throughout the year, one time a year, we sent uh, these boxes that had a personalized gift, something from where they went to college. Or sometimes uh, online, you can find that they work with dog rescues. So we'll send dog bones to the person. Um, so we spend some time finding out about that person and they, they think, wow, that, you know, Christina's creative and she's spending a little extra time getting to know me. And if she's doing that for me, she must be doing the same for her candidates and she gets it and she takes this seriously. So those types of sales and marketing techniques, uh, has, have really worked for us. Um, and you know, that type of idea did come from one of your coaches. They said, have you ever thought about sending out a gift? And my first reaction was like, oh no, not another Christmas goodie being sent. Um, so I took it a little differently and decided to do something a little unique and a little off season. Um, and that has worked very, very well for us. I love it. And by the way, we'll give a shout out to Julie McGrath. Uh, I think that was your conversation with her that um, that was the genesis of that idea. And what I love about that is the way you approach clients, and I want every, all the listeners to really think about this for a second, the way you approach your clients, consciously or subconsciously, you're giving them a preview of how you're going to recruit for them, right? How are you going to approach and engage with candidates to fill their, uh, their position? So if you're just sending a generic email that seems like the same ones they get from all these other vendors that are super annoying, then it's logical to assume that's probably what you're doing to get candidates as well, right? Is like fire tons of automated messages uh, at them. And it doesn't really inspire confidence that you're going to be their recruiter that's going to represent their organization and their opportunity in the best possible way and maximize the talent pool that they're able to get access to. But the way you're doing it is, yes, you're being persistent, um, but you're also being very targeted, very relevant, and also creative and fun. And so you're, you're telegraphing to them that, look, all this effort that we're putting into winning your business the creativity, the persistence, the combination of automation, as well as you know personalization, we use similar tactics and strategies in our recruiting process. So, without even having to say that, they're you know they're going to make that inference, aren't they? So, I think it's uh, I think it's fantastic. The other thing, which I think you're not giving yourself enough credit, Christina, because there's so much more that you've. You've done, by the way, definitely check out Christina on LinkedIn. It's Christina Stroud, S-T-R-O-U-D, because uh, the content that you're putting out is really high quality as well, both the content as well as the design. You've put a lot of thought and effort into that. And then um, tell me about your podcast. Like, Why did you decide to go down that road and what's been the benefit to you so far? Yeah, the podcast has been um, something way, way out of my comfort zone over the past year. Um, and it was originally... It seems like a recurring theme. <laughs> it is. I think it really is. Um, I think, you know, I decided to do it. Uh, it was recommended um, within your community um, as a way to attract clients and candidates. And, um, and I liked that idea but it felt a little self-serving to me and, and it didn't feel like that's who I was. Um, and so I really wanted to create something that may benefit someone um, out there. And I think within recruiting, well, I should take that back, within companies, when I was on the other side, um, you know, there's a lot of attention built around um, senior executives, you know, sort of that director level and above and, um, you know, making sure they go to the training and the development and, um, you know, bringing in an ROI for their company. 
Um, and the very new starters, early career folks, you know, are folks that they're putting in positions that can do a lot of the grunt work that's helping them build their foundation in their career. Um, and they go to some early training. But that middle management group doesn't get a whole lot um, from companies in general, in my experience, especially within private equity. And so I decided that my audience was going to be that middle manager who has the aspiration to grow into an executive role. Um, and I wanted somebody that uh, may not be getting a whole lot of direction from their company or they want to add on and even develop further from what they're able to get from the company. So we started interviewing executives um, from some well-known companies that and talk about their career path, um, why they made the career steps that they did. Um, a lot of them started in one field and then moved to another. So why did they make those moves? Um, we've interviewed some HR executives talking about how important it is to diversify and not stay, um, you know, an electrical engineer the whole time. Why not move and do some type of software engineer role? Um, or if you're a production manager, why not move into supply chain for a few years and become more well-rounded? So the, the purpose was to help those managers think broader than what they may have in the past from people who've been there and done that. Um, and the response has been great. Um, we are now, after a year, we're starting to have executives reach out and want to be podcast guests, which is great. Um, we have had um, some earlier career folks reach out to us and say, hey, I heard this. Um, would you look at my resume or would you, you know, I'm interviewing at this company. Do you know anyone there? And, you know, can you put in a good word for us? So people are listening and liking the very practical tips that they're getting from people who have been in their shoes. And so um, it's it's been really, a, it's been a lot of fun uh, for sure. I've, I'm starting to get more comfortable on podcasts, uh, still not completely there, um, but it's been good for business and it's been good for the listeners and uh, something we'll definitely keep as one of our tools going forward. Fantastic. And then what, obviously you're, you're helping people. There's a big benefit to your audience and people are responding, saying, you know, that they've really enjoyed it. And, and that's, uh, that must feel great. What's been the benefit to you though, in terms of ROI or, or, you know, uh, credibility, what do you feel, you know, if you're continuing to do it, you, it, it must be worthwhile. How, how do you quantify that? Yeah, for sure. And the quantification is is hard because you can you can somewhat tell how many people are listening, how many, you know, listeners you get, but not not precisely. Um however, we have had people that we have not had contact with in the past reach out to us and are looking for a new job and they'd like for us to work with them to find a new role. Um and in some cases that has been very successful for us and we've been able to match them with somebody in our client base for a role. So that's been terrific. Um and it's successful for not only me, but the client and the candidate as well, right? So that part has been great. We have had two new clients from the podcast. Um, I didn't know that they had listened to the podcast episode until we were doing the kickoff and I started digging more and more into, you know, how they found me and how this started developing. And they'll say, oh, I heard you on the podcast or so, so and so in my company heard you on the podcast and thought that we should meet. Um, so for sure, I know I have placed a candidate that reached out to me and I've got two clients that are um, now in my portfolio from either listening to the podcast directly or having somebody recommend it due to the podcast. So financially, it's been a nice boost for our company as well. Fantastic. I love that. That's so cool. Um, look, on a related note, you, may, you said that you're starting to feel more comfortable on podcasts. Um, and, and by the way, I've listened to your podcast and you sound great you're doing such a uh, a brilliant job with that um could you speak a little on the biggest challenge that you had to overcome in your kind of career your business um and you know and 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 how you navigated that oh my gosh so many challenges <laughs> um 
I, you know, there's been um, a few. I would say, um, you know, naturally I'm an introvert. And it, I'm one of those people that, you know, if I go into a holiday party and I only know a few people, it's a struggle for me to walk up and start a conversation. In fact, it probably won't happen. I will just stick with the couple people that I know. Um, and so, you know, that is difficult when you own a recruiting firm because you're reaching out to people you don't know or people that you want to know or people maybe you've you know, talk to at a conference or something, but you really want to start building that relationship. And so owning your own business, especially in recruiting, requires some skill sets that are more on the extroverted side of the scale. And so I've had to learn how to, um, you know, be what I would call on um, when needed and take those fears away, um, take a deep breath before I walk into uh, a networking event and be able to put those um, fears and the nervousness aside. Um, and I actually end up having a lot of fun. And again, it goes back to that challenge and pushing myself. Um, it's like a sport. I, I know I've said that a couple of times, but you walk into a room and I'll, I'll challenge myself and say, okay, I'm going to meet five people that I have never seen before in my entire life. And this is how it's going to work. Um, the natural Christina would say, absolutely not. I'm going to stand here next to the one person I know. But if you if you make it a goal and a challenge, you can do it. It's, you know, that goes back to that mindset of, okay, I'm going to get this done so then I can go home and read a book under a blanket and not worry about it anymore. Um, so, you know, that part was a, a huge challenge um, for me. Um, the other challenge that I've had is... Christina. Go ahead. Sorry. Can yeah. Can I just uh, can I just speak to that because first of all, thank you for sharing that and being being open about it. Because I suspect there's more people who are on the introverted side in recruiting than we realize. Like you think of a typical recruiter as being someone who's very extroverted, right? Is what you would assume is someone who you know is life of the party, someone who's quite loud, talks fast, you know, likes making cold calls, is like goes to networking events and like um like really works the room. You know, this that's the profile that you kind of associate with being a successful recruiter. But I know that there's many people like you who actually, yeah, they can turn it on when they have to, but they're natural kind of preference is to be more introverted and uh it's definitely not in their comfort zone even it's funny because um you and uh, you know one of the members of our community mike williams who has been on the podcast as well and he's famous for being a monster on the phone he makes a lot of cool calls and that's how he's won a lot of his business but he told me he's quite introverted as well believe it or not so i think and and for me i also am, you know, sort of introverted as well. I'm happy speaking or like hosting a podcast, that kind of stuff, but I don't like parties. I don't like, you know, I would rather have a quiet dinner with a few friends rather than go to a party like any day of the, of the week. Um, so I think just in case the list, someone's listening who needs to hear that and realize you can be really successful in recruiting without being you know, like a stereotypical, fast talking, you know, extroverted recruiter. Um, also, I just wanted to ask you though, like what your process is for turning it on. It was what you, the way you said, it, almost like you're getting ready for a, a, a sports game. Mm -hmm. What is that? How do you do that? Because some, I think what some people struggle with is they don't know how to turn it on when they need it. And that would definitely be a barrier to being successful in this business is, you know, so Kit, do you know, like, are you consciously aware of what that involves, how, how you get yourself to follow through and take those actions when you're feeling uncomfortable? Yeah, it's, it's such a great question because, I, and I think it's different for different people, what makes them feel um, confident enough to be able to to turn those more extroverted skills on. Um, for me, what I found is before I walk into a room or before I 
you know, go up and introduce myself to somebody that I don't know. I literally close my eyes and take a deep breath. Um, and I sort of visualize myself being friends with that person, even if it's a business um, event, I consider my, you know, I can picture myself talking to them and laughing and having a good time, just like when I talk to one of my friends from college, right? So um, I visualize it happening. Uh, I calm myself down with a deep breath, and then I go directly over to that person and um, say hello and shake their hand before I have time to think about it. So I don't work the room and slowly get over to them because that gives me too much opportunity to stop and realize what I'm doing and chicken out. So I have to take a very direct approach <laughs> um, and, you know, get past that. And once you get past that initial hello, it's easy. It really is. It scared me for so long. Um, and and I won't say it's comfortable, but, you know, they're probably nervous too. And if you go up and introduce yourself, they're probably happy to be talking to somebody um, and even if, you know, the conversation doesn't go super great, there's no harm done at all. If anything, you've just made one more connection. Um, and so that's the way I look at it is nothing bad is going to happen. You're just saying hello, introducing yourself. If there's no spark or you can't get a conversation started, okay, that's one more person you can connect to on LinkedIn later. And that's all you, that's all it is. So I had to take this big, scary thing in front of me and just tackle it head on quickly when I go somewhere. And then after that, you know, the, the relationship just sort of manages it itself. But that closing my eyes and taking a deep breath um, Beautiful. is huge for me. And, it, you know, people who've seen me outside of a conference room probably see me do that. But, you know, I don't care. <laughs> it's what works. <laughs> well, so it's so interesting because uh, I, I, you, you, I think you know, or you, you may or may not know that Julie and I just did a four-day public speaking course in London last week, which was super intense. It was like nine hours a day, 10 hours a day. And you had to do a lot of practice, standing up in front of a small group and speaking and then getting constructive feedback and that sort of thing. But the, um, the guy who was running the course was mentored by Tony Robbins and, um, has met him a you know uh, several times. They've spoken on the stage together several times, and you know he reminded us that to change your state, there's really only two things you can do. You can change your physicality or your physiology, how you're using your body. So in your case, that would be the breathe, the deep breathing, right? And or you can change your focus, what you're focused on. And for you, that's the visualization of. Uh, you're running a movie in your head of something positive, right? You're thinking about laughing with them, of you know, imagining as if you were friends already, and how that would change the dynamic of the conversation. And so it's just really interesting that you're you've you have a strategy to get yourself to take action when you are feeling uncomfortable. That has been effective for you. I think that's really powerful because. A lot of us, whether it's cold calling, whether it's networking, whether whatever it is that we want to do, well, we want the outcome, but we're scared of the process. Um, we make worst case scenario pictures in our head, don't we? We play like the movies of the it it being horrible. And what you're doing is you're doing the opposite. You're playing the picture of it all working out. And you're also minimizing the downside. You're saying, like, what's the worst that can happen? Okay, well. Maybe we just don't click, but it's still another good contact and there's no harm done. So thank you so much for sharing your your strategy. I think that could benefit a lot of people, Christina. Oh, you're welcome. You know, I would say it's it's once you do that a few times, it does get a little bit easier. Um, when I very first started pushing myself to meet new people or potential clients, I would research the heck out of that person, you know, before I went to an event or before I got on a call so that when I got on there, I already knew some personal things about them. So we could, you know, um, talk about college football or we could talk about cars that I'm very passionate about. So, you know, I tried to find something that was... Um, of mutual interest. Um, and if you do your research, it helps. And even if I didn't use it in the conversation, I felt like I already knew this person and it wasn't just a, you know, a name and a body 
in front of me. And um, now I don't have to do that quite as much. But at the beginning, it was a really easy way to make myself feel um, like I was coming from a place of, of confidence that I, I knew I could do this. And this wasn't a big, scary person that I was trying to meet. It was just another person who um, I have some interests that are in common with. And it, it's just built from there. I love it. That's beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing that. So, um, Christina, what's next for, you know, for the business? What, um, what's the vision for Group 928 in 2024? Yeah, timely question. So I've been working with my team um, over the past few weeks. We've been analyzing how 2023 went, um, what went well, what we would have done differently if we could go back. Um, and we're planning 2024. So I know a few things for sure. We've, we've definitely set our financial goals. Um, and that's very exciting. Um, I have decided to, in order to meet those goals, um, I need to go ahead and build the team. So we're going to be hiring some full desk recruiters. Uh, that will help. Um, I have somebody that is the head of business development. So he can do a lot of that work. And then I'll have full desk recruiters to support him in his efforts. Um, I will probably get out of some of the day to day. Uh, recruiting, which I've been trying to ease out of and let uh, others do a lot of the administrative work so that I can focus mostly on BD and building the relationships with potential clients. So I, I truly think that 2024 is going to be a breakthrough year for us. Uh, even though we've grown dramatically in three years, I think um, this will be the year that's sort of that turning point for us from going from a small three-person company to something much larger. So uh, exciting, exciting times for us, for sure. That is exciting. And it's so funny that now you're at a place where originally you were the recruiter and you didn't uh, have any business development experience. Now you're looking to transition so that you're delegating the recruiting and you're doing more business development. Isn't that funny? Um, Christina, I'm really grateful to have you as part of our community. I think because you're so generous and you've helped so many people and you're very welcoming to new people joining our coaching program as well. And, uh, I'm, I'm grateful to have you as a client and thanks for doing the podcast. No, thank you. As I've, I've shared with you offline and here, your group, uh, and you in particular have made all the difference in my company. So um, I'm very, very thankful that uh, I came across your group um, and it, it has just really projected my career and my business in a way that I really could never have imagined. So I appreciate you. 